it's, there's a concert ringing in the ear. I, I, I had it since November. This November will be one year. Uh, the only other option I have now is I've done it. Welcome back, everyone. It's a hearing aid. But I'm still waiting for November to make one year, and then I'll see about getting the hearing aid. You guys asked some good questions. It took us a little longer than normal to, to get through them. So welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed some refreshments. Um, the nominating committee members will now ask the audience uh, submitted questions uh, of the candidates. Uh, and so we're going to start um, with this question, and it'll go to all three candidates. And we'll start with uh, Danny. We'll start with you on this one and just go down the, the row. Uh, the question is, how do you feel about opening up the Escuela Gate at Stonehouse on the north? And if you do support opening it, would you support a passive or a manned gate? Well, that, uh, as I said earlier, that, that specific issue, as all issues, uh, I'd have to really evaluate it in terms of cost and benefit, uh, whether we even need one or don't need one. And so without all that information, I can't say I could have uh, an opinion f fully one way or, or the other. But I can say that as part of my uh, spiel for my candidacy was to be open-minded, uh, listen to both sides, and make a well-educated uh, economical, financial uh, decision on whether to do or not to do uh, the gate on Escuela. Okay, thank you. Same question to you, Cheryl. I, you probably know this, <laughs> I'm very much in favor of opening the Escuela Gate. Um, I feel like we are going to need to have, you know, some additional help in getting people out of our community. And, and we've been working on this and we've been setting aside money um, on RMA to do this. So I'm really looking forward to the time that we can open it. But I think that when it is opened, it'll go in a very slow process. Um, we'll start with a passive gate. I would recommend that we start with a passive gate and it be opened when we have major functions at uh, Stonehouse Park. And um, I've been a member of homeowners associations um, in the past that have had passive gates. Um, we have them all around us. Serrano has a number of them. Um, so there are places that we've gone or we can go to actually observe how this works. So in talking with our maintenance department, there are ways that we can make sure that um, it, it can be done successfully and still be monitored at the main gate. So I am in favor of it. Thank you. Larry? Um, Cheryl and I kind of have a similar opinion because we're, we're, we worked on this on the RMA board together. Um, one, one of the issues, one of the major issues is that when there are a lot of pu uh, public type events at Stonehouse Park um, where soccer teams come in from outside or baseball teams, they, they get through the gates and then they have access to all of our facilities. One advantage in putting in a gate at Stonehouse Park it, on, on Esqualo uh, Road is that we can control it by having double gates. So we open one, the first gate closest to the highway, and that allows outside people to get in, but only get into Stonehouse Park. The second gate would be into our community, which will, would only be accessed through our barcodes. And as Cheryl pointed out, we have already set aside or started setting aside enough money to finance a passive gate by the end of 2019. And, and I, I think that should be our goal, and, and it, that follows right along with the security that we get when we add the passive gate. Uh, right now, um, one of our big security issues is all the outside influence that we get, have getting in our gates and causing problems. Can I add an item to that? Can we add to our, our question? Uh, you want to add to your answer? Want, yeah. Can we add a little bit to uh, Committee? What do you? What, uh, <laughs> uh, if we open it to you, we're going to have to open it to okay. all the candidates That's too. That's fine. Then. That's fine. Yeah. Well, I'll hold it till next time. <laughs> are, are you sure? <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So, uh, question number two. Question number two. We're going to start with Cheryl and and move uh, down the road from there. Uh, so the question reads: Do you think that RM residents, Rancho Marietta residents, 
should be required to join and pay dues to the country club? Well, we all know that they used to all belong to it. To it. Um, when you bought property here, you were an automatic member of the country club, and then that changed around 2000. Um, so now that we've got a situation where the country club is struggling and needs, needs um, to be renovated and needs an infusion of new members, it's certainly a concept that has been tossed around a lot and discussed in this community a lot. So um, I don't think that we, we can go backwards and force that on anyone. So I think that it's going to have to be um, some other kinds of options that we'll look at to regenerate our country club. I am a, a golf member and a t avid tennis player with the country club. I want nothing more than to see it get renovated and regenerated. Um, but I don't think that we can at this point expect that all people will be a member of it. Thank you. Larry? Oh, coming this way. Good. Um, I, the, the concept of, of trying to find ways to, to uh, support the country club is a very good one, and I have no objection in, in um, working with the country club to, to figure out solutions if we have some resources in RMA that we can allot to that effort. I, I don't believe in uh, taxation without representation, though, so we, I, I think it would be inappropriate for the board or to CSD to, or uh, our, uh, the, the country club to try and force everyone to pay a membership without getting something in return for that. And uh, that, that's where the negotiation comes in. And, and I do understand the, the, their needs, and I, and I, I, I think that, it's, that their, their existence in this community is very valuable because it does help support our property values. But it will only do that if, if it's, val if it's a, a valuable um, entity and it, it's sustainable and it is self-supporting. Okay, thank you. Danny, same question to you. No, I, I do not think that uh, you should be able to force anybody. I believe, though, if you think it's a viable option, you put it up for vote for the, the people and let them decide. It's such of a magnitude that I think that's the only uh, option. Okay, thank you. Uh, this looks like it's going to be the final question, and it's going to start over here with, uh, with Larry. Uh, Larry, the question is, what do you consider to be responsible development? Um, somewhere between no development and way too much development. <laughs> <laughs> responsible development is actually pretty easy to define. We need uh, additional income. Uh, RMA needs uh, additional income. Our, our infrastructure is 40 years old. We're constantly spending a lot of money repairing various different things in this community that are just going to get worse with time. And uh, we, we need a shot in, the, in, in our arm uh, uh, financially. And, and I think all of us would like to have more facilities across the street, doctors and dentists and various other things, uh, veterinarians, uh, how far do you have to drive for your pet? But uh, uh, so, so there's, there's a balance between that and too much uh, development that is going to uh, consume our natural resources that we have, which is our, uh, uh, one of the other candidates across the street doesn't want us to use the term open space, but we still need to protect a certain amount of that land that we currently use for recreation. And it's very valuable to us. It's an asset for us to be able to use that space and not have it developed. So. There is a balance there, and, and I think that's important for the board members to, to make an, an honest uh, evaluation when development starts approaching us and, and, and how we restrict that to where it is, is appropriate for our needs, but not too much that it exceeds the, the space that we have uh, that, that we uh, tr consider valuable. Thank you. Danny, same question. Yes, I, I believe that uh, uh, development is inevitable. It's, it's going to happen. That's just the way it is. Uh, to be responsible, I'd say that uh, 
the developer would, uh, should contribute to his fair share in uh, what, uh, what they add to our community and also to abide by the established guidelines that were set forth uh, way, way back and adhere to those, make sure the developer adheres to those and uh, try to work with the developer in, in any kind of uh, things that we might like to see remain the same and hopefully as in a sense of uh, good goodwill they would be willing to do that and if not you know that's uh, what we have to live with hopefully I would imagine that uh, they have so many homes they can build and uh, if it's established in the, the guidelines thus far that we uh, as a board would adhere to that and hold them to that okay thank you uh, Cheryl same question I would define it as um, development that is in complete adherence with our MBA the mutual benefit agreement in the areas of density area of traffic mitigation and in the areas of adherence to our CCNRs and to keep the standards for our homes and our communities and our streets um, continuing to improve and not expanding into areas that are going to cause further traffic uh, traffic problems and things like that right now we have excessive traffic on para we have excessive traffic on the parkway and places that we have people come to us and talk about people speeding and going through stop signs and so we would want to make sure that the traffic mitigation plan for any future development is addressing um, that with their ingress and their egress of this community so I think that that's one area we would look at and then of course any future development that's approved after, uh, is going to have to go through any, an EIR economic impact review and there are 13 areas that have to be addressed in that that all impact our community and we would want to make sure that any future development that is improved that is that is approved addresses those 13 areas in, in no way in a negative way for our community okay uh, thank you well that wraps up our candidates night um, I do want to wish uh, all three candidates uh, good luck in uh, the rest of your campaign and I want to thank the nominating committee for their work as well um, uh, how about uh, let's give everybody a nice robust uh, round of applause for this evening um, all all RMA members should have received their ballots by now uh, and uh, they went out at the end of last week if you didn't get a ballot uh, please call RMA office at 354-3500 and remember the old saying vote early and vote often and thank you and have a good night <laughs>